So good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to another uh, Global Immunotalks. Um, it's now noon on the East Coast, so it's a real pleasure to uh, be here. I'm one of the hosts of the Global Immunotalk series. My name is Kate Fitzgerald, and I'm located at the University of Massachusetts um, Chan Medical School. So welcome to today's session. Uh, we have a real treat in store with uh, Professor Mark Hello, joining us from, from France. Uh, I'm going to introduce Mark uh, in a moment, but I just want to remind everybody that next week's speaker will be Vijay Kutru on September 20th. So let me start by introducing uh, Mark. So Mark is joining us today um, from Marseille. Uh, he's currently uh, a group leader and professor at the Center for Immunology at Marseille Lumini, so the CIML there. Mark did his uh, PhD uh, in Paris at the Koken Institute, working with Drs. Elizabeth Gomard and Jean Girard, Girard Gillet, uh, where he did, worked on CD8 T cell responses in HIV infection and uh, did some nice work where he demonstrated that um, anti-CD8 T cell responses to HIV appeared to be delayed and blunted, really sort of underscoring the compromise crosstalk between innate and adaptive immunity. And then following that, Mark moved to the US for postdoctoral training where he joined the lab of uh, the late Christine Byron uh, at Brown University in Providence. And there Mark studied the role of NK cells and dendritic cells in antiviral immunity in the mouse system. He really contributed to the early discoveries of mouse plasmacytoid dendritic cells in collaboration with uh, Kareen Oseline Pacharel, Georgia Trincheri, and other colleagues, and really sort of prefer, performed some of the first functional studies of plasmacytoid dendritic cells in vivo. He then moved back to France in 2003. And since returning to France, he's really pioneered the use of comparative genomics to study different immune cell types across tissues and species, in particular focusing on dendritic cell types and their role in humans and mice, um, really sort of defining a unified nomenclature for these cell types uh, in, in these different species. Mark has had many additional discoveries, which I won't go into in, in great detail. And I think we're gonna hear a lot about his, his work today. Uh, he's gonna to talk about deciphering the, in, the identity functions and molecular regulation of dendritic cell types. So welcome, Mark. Uh, if you could turn on your camera and your, we can also unmute. Great to have you joining us today from uh, Marseille. So Mark, usually for these, um, talks, we have the presenter tell us a little bit about yourself. This is obviously an international audience. Uh, you're currently in France. So tell us where you grew up and give us a little short uh, detour into your history. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and an immense honor to be there to present the work of my team. I grew up in uh, South Burgundy in France until I was 18. And then I moved for graduate studies and undergraduate studies and graduate studies uh, at the university in, uh, in the Paris area, in the north of France. Uh, yeah. Actually, I, I worked at the Ecole Normale Supérieure of Paris then, and uh, where I, uh, I did my master's studies there. And uh, after my PhD, uh, I moved to Christine Byron Lab, like you said, and then I wanted to come back to France because I love my country and I wanted to be closer to my family. And uh, I'm not from Marseille, so but uh, in the end, I, uh, I found that the CML was an exceptional environment to work in immunology. So uh, I was happy that they accepted me there. And that's how I ended up in Marseille. Yeah, it's a great environment for innate immunity, I think, in Marseille. You guys have a good group there. All right. So I have a, a question for you. This, this is always an interesting part of these talks, particularly for trainees to sort of learn about, you know, successful scientists like yourself. But can you tell us a little bit about a trade in your personality that has sort of really prepared you well for success, um, you know, that, that you benefited from? Okay, thank you. I think there are a couple of them. The first one is maybe a strong will and perseverance. 
because uh, you always, especially in, in science, sometimes you get negative results or you that you don't get the results you expect, and you have to be able to uh, to know to to pursue your work and to keep uh, faith and to keep uh, motivation. So it's important to have strong will and perseverance. Yeah. But I I would say it's also the ability to concentrate and work very hard for a long period of times. Uh, but at the same time, to take a break from time to time because it's important to be able sometimes to to be able to to find new energy and new resources by stopping about uh, thinking about the work and doing good things with your family or reading a book or whatever. And yep. I think to my students, as always, stay. It's important not to keep, not to uh, feel guilty when you are out of work, and then to be able to really think of other things and find new energy and reciprocally to be at work thinking about work when you are at work. And I think it's very important. Uh, last thing I think is uh, is curiosity because uh, that's what is driving me in research and passion. And I think that you cannot be well to be a good scientist. You have to be, to have strong motivation, which comes from curiosity and passion, as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, no, those those are three great answers. Yeah, three <laughs> three great traits that um, I think we all strive for, especially the balance. I agree. I think you have to have good balance in life. All right, so Mark, why don't you, um, if you could share your screen and then uh, we can get started. We're really excited to hear about your work. You're going to tell us about deciphering the identity functions and molecular regulation of DC types. All right, thank you very much. I'll try yeah. to get the pointer as well. So uh, we are interested in dendritic cells because these cells are very important for the orchestration of adaptive immunity because they are especially efficient for the activation of naive T cells, which is called T cell priming and their functional polarization. Because of that, they are very good targets for making new vaccines or immunotherapies. And this is very good at that because they can uh, link innate immunity and adaptive immunity in different ways. One way is that dendritic cells are able to receive signals from other innate immune cells, macrophages, neutrophils, plasma cytoid disease, or, or, or other cells. And they can integrate these signals to uh, deliver activation signals to natural killer cells and to C4 T cells and CD8 T cells. And these effector cells are very important, for example, for anti-tumor immunity or for uh, defenses against viral infection. But more generally, Dendritic cells are equipped with a number of innate immune recognition receptors that can recognize different kinds of input signals. They can pick up antigens in the extracellular environment. They can recognize pathogen-associated molecular patterns. They can recognize danger signals. They can recognize cytokines. And so the disease sample different input signals in the environment, and they integrate it. And this integration is going to determine the output signals that the disease are going to deliver to T cells in terms of antigen presentation for T cell receptor activation, in terms of activating or inhibitory co-stimulation, and in terms of uh, activating or immunomodulating cytokines. And these output signals are going to determine the outcome of T cell priming and the functional polarization of T cell responses. So this, uh, this function is therefore very plastic because uh, the body needs to induce a lot of different type of immune responses depending on the threat that it is facing. It's not the same type of responses that protects against fungal infections or against bacteria or against viral infection. And indeed, uh, this is uh, the functional specialization of, of disease allows to mount different immune responses. And this is due to two important features of the dendritic cell family. The first one is that they, they are what people call specialized subsets, different subsets of dendritic cells. For example, a certain subset of dendritic cells may be more efficient for CD8 T cell activation for, or for type 1 helper T cell activation, another subset for TH2, another subset for inducing regulatory T cells. So you have some cells, DC subset that are already uh, poised to mount specific type of immune responses. But still, each dendritic cell subset as plasticity, because depending on the input signals that it is sensing, it will deliver a different combination of output signals to the T cells. And therefore, the same DC subset can polarize T cell responses toward different functions depending on the context. And what, what people call subsets, in fact, in the, in, the, in the first instance, is what I, is different cell types. And these different cell types can undergo different activation states, which is 
uh, what confer them functional plasticity. And therefore, uh, one of the things that char characterize the different DC types is that they are equipped with different arrays of uh, innate immune recognition receptors to detect different universe of input signals. And they can deliver different uh, output signals and they are made in a way that links the input signals with output signals. And these combinations uh, define the universe of responses that the given DC type can mount. And then the actual combination of input signal that the DC type senses is going to determine the actual combination of output signals is going to deliver in a specific physiopathological context. And that's where you have different activation states that can be induced. And that's where you get plasticity of the function of a given DC type. So in my lab for many years, what we try to do is to better determine how we can uh, uh, identify DC types and define them and then how we can determine their functions and the regulation of their functions. And to do that, we think it's important because to understand and manipulate immune cell functions, you need to be able to isolate them or to look at them in tissues. And for that, you need to be able to identify them in a way that is very rigorous and uh, very specific. Uh, and it's important because to study functions, you need to be able to uh, associate the function to the right combination of cell type and cell state. And we think that one of the things that differentiates cell type from cell state is that the cell type is independent of activation condition, contrary to the cell state. By essence, it's, uh, it's linked to activation. So, for example, a plasma cytoid disease is still going to keep its core identity of uh, the cell type plasma cytoid on the cell, whether it's at steady state or whether it's answer answering to a viral infection by making an FN alpha beta, is going to stay. Uh, to keep its core identity of plasma cytoid dendritic cells, whether it's uh, in the spleen, in lymph node, or in the intestine. And uh, we expect the core identity of these cells, like for a B cell or for a T cell, to be strongly conserved, whether you look at it in a mouse or we, whether you look at it in a human. And therefore, that's why we thought that harnessing comparative genomics would help to align dendritic cell types across activation conditions, across tissues, and across species. And by doing that, we thought that if we can therefore characterize the lytic cells genetically with uh, enough depth, by clustering them, we could establish the equivalences between DC types across tissues and species. We could define molecular footprints that would identify DC types in an unbiased, robust, and universal manner. And these transcriptomic signatures can then be used for other analysis. These transcriptomic signatures would al allow also to do gene networks analysis, and this could help to draw hypotheses on the functional specialization of DC types and on their molecular regulation. And finally, we could even decide, which is what we are trying to do uh, on certain aspects, to focus on evolutionary conserved footprints and gene networks to try to accelerate translation of what we learn in the mouse to uh, what uh, can be extended to humans. So in my lab for many years now, we have developed the following strategy built on that, which is to generate hypotheses on analytic cells based on comparing their gene expression program between the human and the mouse. Initially, we did that at steady state and, there, and then under activation conditions, initially by macroarray on uh, bulk population, then by RNA seq on bulk population, and more recently by single cell RNA sequencing. And this is helping us to establish the identity of DC types to determine the homology between DC types across species, especially between human and mouse, to predict concert function of DC types and to predict their molecular regulation. Once we have made these uh, hypotheses and predictions, the second phase in our strategy is to try to experimentally test them in mice because the mouse model is amenable to a lot of manipulations for looking at uh, link between uh, cause and consequence and for looking at, uh, at mechanisms. And for that, we have been developing novel mouse strains to target DC types. For example, strains expressing fluorescent reporters in certain DC types, like conventional type 1 dendritic cells or plasma cytoid dendritic cells, to look where those cells are in tissues and then how they move. We developed mice that are constitutively and specifically devoid of a given DC type of CDC1 or of PDC to look how the loss of this DC, DC type impacts antiviral response or antitumor responses. And we generate a CRE recombinase expressing mice, specifically in CT1 or PDC, to manipulate the genes in vivo in these DC types to understand how they are molecularly regulated. 
Then we challenge those mice with infectious or tumor models, and we look uh, how the way we manipulate disease is changing the outcome of uh, the pathology. And then the third phase of our strategy is once we have kind of screened our hypothesis and candidate genes and pathways in the mouse, the idea is to see if what we found is the mouse is conserved in humans. And for that also, as I will illustrate, we, we needed to develop faithful malleable in vitro model of human DC types to be able to uh, also play uh, with the pharmacological manipulation or genetic manipulation of human DC types to test the hypothesis that were shown to be true in the mouse. Later on, we'd like to develop DC cultures with other cells. So of course, DC cultures with T cells, but more generally perhaps cultures in organoids to try to model in vitro how the disease work in a, in a tissue or in an organ environment. And we have started to, to work in macaque also to, to move toward preclinical pre -clinical models to understand how DC type work in vivo in primates and to develop applications for vaccination or immunotherapy. So I will uh, tell three stories corresponding to these three uh, stages in our strategies. Uh, some are relatively old stories, but I never had the time to, to the, the invitation to, to, to show them before. And I think it's interesting in, in the context of our strategy. Um, so the first one is uh, back from uh, the first uh, studies we did to use comparative genomics to try to align human and mouse DC types. So at the time, what we did is that we generated microarrays to characterize the gene expression profile of a number of mouse immune cells, including mouse plasma cytoid normalic cells, mouse spleen CD11B disease, mouse spleen CD8 alpha disease, but also mouse and mouse and case cells, mouse T cells. We completed that with public data of macroarray compatible macroarray from other uh, labs, and then we did the. Uh, collaborate with people to generate a similar compendium with human cells, including human BDCA3 uh, blood disease, human BDCA1 blood disease, and human plasma cytoid dendritic cells, and the other human immune cells. And we were able to identify more than 2,000 pairs of autologous genes that had sufficient variation in each data set across all the immune cell types we looked at, sufficient variation within the mouse data set, and sufficient variation within the human data set, and we were able to develop a normalization method and, and, uh, and to uh, make compatible the range of gene expression uh, variation within the mouse data set and within the human data set to, to be able to, to integrate them together. And then we could uh, cluster the cell types to see uh, what their uh, transcriptomic proximity was comparing the human and mouse cells. And what you can see is that when you pull everything together, you get a clustering tree where all the human and mouse lymphocytes make a sub-branch of the tree. And then all the human and mouse myeloid cells and dendritic cells make another sub-branch of the tree. And within the second branch, you have the disease within a, a, a sub-branch away from monocytes, neutrophils, and macrophages. So it shows that uh, including for plasma cytoid disease, there is a stronger transcriptomic similarity between DC types compared to one another as compared to monocytes, macrophages, or lymphocytes. And because all the DC, the DC types fall into the same sub-branch, it's rigorous now to focus on this sub-branch and to reduce the clustering, but only on the genes that are differentially expressed strongly enough between these different samples without taking in, any more into account the genes that are differentially expressed in the other cells, but are not so differentially expressed in disease. That's what we did. And now when we focus only on disease, you have the mouse cells in blue and the human cells in black. You can see that again, we find that human PDCs are clustering with mouse PDCs. But now when we focused on about a thousand pair of autologous genes, we find that mouse CD8 alpha spleen dendritic cells cluster with human BDCA3 positive blood dendritic cells. And that what has now been called type one conventional dendritic cell that is now considered as a given DC type that is conserved across tissues and across species, including between mouse and human. And mouse CD11B splenic dendritic cell cluster with human and BDCA1 blood dendritic cells. And that is now what is called type two conventional dendritic cells that are conserved across tissues and species. And in addition, our study allowed us also to uncover novel candidate genes for the regulation of the biology of DC types based on their strong selective expression in a conserved manner in the same human and mouse DC type. Uh, 
so for example, we identified XR1, a chemokine receptor that is the only one of this family, which is we found initially expressed only on mouse XR1 positive dendritic cells in this paper. But we soon realized that it was also expressed specifically in human only on mouse on human CDC1. And the ligand for XR1, which is called lymphotactin, is a chemokine that is specifically expressed by cytotoxic lymphocytes, especially natural killer cells and CDC1. was involved functionally in the interactions between CDC1 and NK cells and CD8 T cells. So to finish this first part, uh, in this uh, comparative genomic approach uh, allowed to spearhead the development of a simplified and consistent definition of DC types with a simplified nomenclature, which is a, a, a thing that often people outside of the DC field are craving for because they think that there are too many subsets and that it's too complex. But in fact, you can nail it down to, to uh, major uh, DC types that are conserved across tissue species and activation conditions especially type 1 conventional dendritic cells and type 2 conventional dendritic cells. Uh, in my team, we are focusing especially on plasmacytoid dendritic cells and type 1 conventional dendritic cells because uh, I'm especially interested in antiviral responses and anti-tumor responses. PDCs are professional producers of type 1 and type 3 interferon upon triggering of toll like receptors 7 and 9. Type 1 and type 3 interferon are the most efficient antiviral cytokines in the body and are critical for antiviral defense in mouse and human. And TL7 and TL9 are sensors that are in, in the endosomes of cells allowed to detect uh, nucleic acids derived from engulfed viruses. So this is really important for sensing viral infections and therefore PDCs are proposed to be very important for innate defenses against viruses. As far as CDC1 are concerned, they are very good for activating cytotoxic lymphocytes, both innate ones like natural killer cells and adaptive ones like CD8 T cells. And especially they are very good at cross-presenting cell-associated antigens, which is critical for inducing CD8 T cell responses against antigens that are not expressed in disease or, or against viruses that don't infect disease where direct presentation cannot occur. And therefore, uh, CDC1 have been shown over the time to be very important for antiviral defense and defense against tumors. Um, so we uh, next developed mouse models to be able to look at the role of CDC1 and PDCs in vivo. And here I'm going to tell a second story about trying to understand the role of XCR1 in CDC1 during mouse cytomegalovirus infection. So again, to show that we are perseverant and we pursue uh, sometimes ideas on a very long time frame, it started uh, with uh, the fact we, after my postdoc in Christine Byron lab, I wanted to understand the crosstalk between NK cell innate antiviral response and CD80 cell adaptive antiviral response. And I wanted to know especially whether NK cell activity was promoting antiviral CD80 cell response during our infection and how it worked. And so when I started my team at TML, that's one of the first studies we developed there with a very talented postdoc, Scott Robbins from the US, who came to postdoc with me in Marseille. So what we decided to do is to compare antiviral CD8 T cell responses in mice that were differing in the efficacy of their NK cell activity. We use mouse cytomegalovirus infection as a model in congenic mice on the bulb C genetic background, but we compared mice that have an efficient NK cell response because they express an NK cell activation receptor that is called LY49H and that is uniquely able to recognize the viral encoded molecule and 157 that is expressed at the surface of infected cells so that the NK cells expressing LY49H are uniquely able to recognize MCMV infected cell and kill them in a certain mouse strains. And this is key for antiviral defense and also for immuno, uh, uh, immuno activation of other cell types for FN gamma secretion. And we compare these mice that have efficient NK cell response with congenic mice on the same genetic background, the parental bulb C strain that has uh, the endogenous NK cell locus that are lacking the activation receptor Y49H and whose NK cell response are inefficient against MCMV because they cannot sense MCMV infected cells and kill them. So at the time, what we showed is that we verified the difference in NK cell response between calorate mice and bulb C mice. You have calorate mice in black and bulb C mice in white. Here we look at the number of NK cells in the spleen during MCM infection. And you can see that in calorate mice, there is an expansion of NK cells in the spleen of infected mice, 
this not a, does not occur in bulb sea mice. This expansion of NK cells in, in, uh, in carate mice is associated with a better control of viral replication as illustrated in the spleen, where you have viral titles over time that go much higher and much faster in uh, bulb sea mice than in carate mice. And we can show that this control of viral infection is indeed mediated by NK cells in carate mice, because if you deplete NK cells with anti-NK1.1 NK1 antibodies in carate mice, you lose viral control and you get viral loads that are as high as in bulb sea mice. So indeed, calorate and bulb sea mice have contrasting and cell responses with MCMV infection. The calorate mice having an efficient and cell response able to control viral replication, which is not the case of the bulb sea mice. So what about CD80 cell responses? So what we did is we compared these two mouse trained for CD80 cell activation. So we use MHA class one tetramers to look at the frequency of antiviral CD80 cells at different time points after infection, day four, day five, and day seven, in calorate mice versus bulb sea mice. And you can see that at day four, you already see you already see a nice expansion of antiviral CD80 cells in carate mice, which is not happening in bulb sea mice. One day later, bulb sea mice have managed to catch up with the calorate mice, and now they have an induction and a frequency of antiviral CD80 cells that is similar to uh, calorate. And later on, the response even increases further in bulb sea mice, whereas it has a, uh, reached a plateau in calorate mice. This is illustrated here with statistic and uh, uh, mean and standard deviation. You can see that in bulb sea mice at day four, you don't have antiviral CD80 cells that are expanded yet, whereas in calorate mice, you have a nice and significant expansion of antiviral CD80 cells, and this is highly significant. Are these T cells functional? So what we did is we did in vivo cytotoxicity assay, where we injected splenocytes in recipient mice. These splenocytes were uh, a mix of three uh, population, ample splenocytes that have no reason to be recognized by the host CD80 cells, splenocytes pulsed with viral epitopes from the IO1 viral gene or the M164 genes that could be recognized by the CD80 cells, uh, the antiviral CD80 cells, and kill. So, if the, the, the idea is that we inject uh, equimolar quantities of these uh, target cells in mice, and then we look over time during infection whether the cells that express viral peptides are killed preferentially as compared to the unpulled cells. What you can see is that before infection, there is no killing. All the three populations are recovered the same way from the spleen a few hours after injection. But if you look at day seven, when both mouse strains have a high frequency of antiviral CD80 cells, you have preferential killing of the peptide pulse targets, showing that there is killing of, uh, of cells uh, presenting viral epitopes. So you have functional cytotoxic antiviral CD80 cells. But at day four, you have only uh, killing in the calorate mice with uh, 60 to 70% killing of MCMV expressing peptides target cells in calorate mice, but you have no killing in bulb C, confirming that you already have efficient cytotoxic T cells in carate mice at day four, but not yet in bulb C. So calorate mice mount faster antiviral CD80 cell responses as compared to bulb C mice. I don't cannot show all the details, but we show that it's not T cell intrinsic because if we compare anti, uh, anti CD80 cells against another intracellular pathogen, Listeria monocytogenes, there is no difference between calorate and bulb C mice. We could show it's dependent on NK cells because in NK cell depleted, depleted carate mice, there is a delay in CD80 cell response. And we could show more specifically that it's dependent on LY49H and 157, and therefore recognition by NK cells of MCMV infected uh, cells. Because if we infect the mice with a virus that is lacking M157 and that can no be, cannot longer be recognized by LY49H and NK cells, we don't have any more difference in the CD80 cell response between carate and bulb mice. So the question is how mechanistically is the NK cell response linked to the CD80 cell response? Are the NK cells directly talking to CD80 cells or is there an intermediate third party cell type? We should maybe it's through CDC1 and maybe in vitro DCR1 because NK cells can secrete the lymphotactin, the chemokine that can attract CDC1 or can maybe stabilize interaction with CDC1 because they express the receptor, the chemokine receptor XCR1. So we decided to look the function of XR1 in this system and the function of CDC1 and look whether CDC1 were the link between efficient NK cell response and efficient CD80 cell response. So our hypothesis was that NK cells could promote immunogenic CDC1 maturation at the right place and the right time 
via uh, XR1, XL1 dependent on counter with CDC1 at sites of our application. So the first thing that, so the, this study was led by Karin Croza, a talented tenure researcher that stayed in my team for over, over 10 years. So she directed this work uh, with, uh, with different PhD students and, and, and engineers. So the first thing they did is to compare NK cell activation during M7 infection in XR1 knockout mice compared to wild type mice. So if you look at IFN gamma production, you see there is a strong increase in NK cells expressing IFN gamma ex vivo after M7 infection in wild type mice, but this is strongly decreased in XR1 knockout mice. That's the same thing for granzyme B. If you look at NK cell expansion, the NK cells that are proliferating, as uh, observed with KI67 staining, they, there is much more proliferation uh, after an infection in wild type mice for the NK cells in the spleen especially the LY49H positive NK cells, but this proliferation is blunted in XR1 knockout mice. And in fact, the global expansion of LY49H positive NK cells is blunted in XR1 knockout mice. So it shows that XR1 deficiency is compromising NK cell responses to viral infection. What about CDC1 activation? So we know that CDC1 can produce IL-12 during M7 infection. So we look at that. You can see indeed that there is an induction of IL-12 in the CDC1 from infected mice, in wild type mice, and that IL-12 uh, in the conditions we looked at is more prominently expressed in CDC1 as compared to plasma cytoid disease or CDC2s. But if you look in XR1 knockout, there is a strong and significant decrease in the proportion of CDC1 activated for IL-12 production. We also look at CCR7 because this chemokine receptor is associated with DC maturation, so their ability to give the good signal to CDA T cells, and with this immigration to the T cell zone, so their ability to go in the right place to activate CDA T cells. And here again, there is an induction of CCR7 on CDC1 during infection, but this induction occurs much more efficiently in wild type mice than in XR1 knockout mice. So XR1 deficiency is also compromising CDC1 activation during MCMV infection. How does it occur in tissues? So for that, we first look at uh, uh, confirm that uh, NK cells are clustering with infected cells in the marginal zone of the spleen, we've questioned before. So we use MOBA1 to stain the marginal zone of the spleen that is separating the red pulp where you have uh, erythrocytes and uh, red pulp macrophages from the wild pulp where we have T cells. We stain for NKP46, which is a specific marker for NK cells, and IFN gamma to look at NK cell producing IFN gamma. And you can see that there is a strong colocalization of virus infected cells in the marginal zone together with NK cells expressing IFN gamma, which is shown here. You see very, and it's uh, zoomed here. You see very nice clusters where you have infected cells in blue in tight proximity with NK cells in uh, green, many of them expressing IFN gamma in red. So where are CDC1? So what we did is we used new mouse models that are developed that expressed the red fluorescent protein specifically in CDC1, and that we crossed with IL-12 beta reporter mice to look at in situ IL-12 expression by CDC1. And you can see that when you look at clusters of IFN gamma producing NK cells in the vicinity of infected cells, in these clusters, you see CDC1, and you see uh, that there are a lot of CDC1 in these clusters. And we can even see CDC1s here shown in pink that are expressing IL-12 in green, so it gives a, a white color here, and that are touching uh, NK cells making IFN gamma, these NK cells here that are red with blue uh, dots in it that represent IFN gamma, and this in the vicinity of our infected cells. So the question is, this co-clustering of MCMV infected cells, NK cells, and CDC1, is it dependent on XR1 to test our hypothesis? So we compared litomates, XR1 knockout with heterozygous litomates that have uh, uh, an efficient uh, XR1 molecule. And uh, Karin and our group quant uh, quantitated the, the clusters of uh, NK cells and infected cells uh, in the marginal zone of the infected mice. You can see already on this picture that we see more clusters in this section of uh, control mice than in this section of XR1 knockout mice. This was carefully quantitated on whole spleen sections from many mice. And you can see that the number of NK cell clusters with infected cells per millimeter square of the spleen is strongly decreased in XR1 knockout mice after infection as compared to wild type mice. Uh, here is an illustration again of the fact that uh, CDC1 
are in tight contact with infected cells and with uh, um, NK cells producing uh, IFN gamma. So I cannot resist showing this nice movie that uh, Marc Ambrosini did with Karen Croza. This is a 3D reconstruction of confocal microscopy where you see a CDC1 expressing IL-12 in red and yellow in tight contact with NK cells that are green and express IFN gamma, which is uh, shown in uh, violet. Uh, and so they quantitated that. They used the red fluorescent protein to quantify CDC1. So they look at NK cell clusters within uh, the spin of wild type mice and of XL1 knockout mice. And they quantitated uh, the, 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 the red fluorescence expression in the clusters to quantify CDC1 as a sure gateway to quantify CDC1. And you can see that there is much more red fluorescent protein expressed in the clusters of NK cells in wild type mice than in XL1 knockout, showing that there is a reduced recruitment of CDC1 in uh, the cluster of NK cells uh, at the site of replication in the marginal zone when you don't have a functional XR1 uh, gene in the mouse. And the CDC1 that are in those clusters, they look at their morphology and they could show that the ones that are in XR1 knockout mice, they are more round and less dendritic, suggesting that they are less activated. And in fact, uh, when they looked at IL-12 expression and looked at the frequency of contacts between CDC1 expressing IL-12 and NK cells, they could see that the frequency of IL-12 expressing CDC1s that were in contact with NK cells was much higher in the wild type mice than in the XR1 knockout mice, showing indeed that XR1 was necessary to allow the NK cells to enter into interactions with CDC1. So how does it happen over time? So they did kinetic studies doing careful quantitation of the location of CDC1 in XR1 knockout mice, which uh, are shown in a uh, uh, full uh, lines and uh, wild type controls in dotted lines. So in wild type controls, you can see that you have an increase of the frequency of CDC1 in the marginal zone initially, and probably they come either from the red pulp or directly from the blood circulation into the marginal zone. This CDC1 later on go in the breeding channel that are allowing the cells to go to the T cell zone uh, from the marginal zone to the T cell zone, and later on they end up in the T cell zone. In contrast, if you look at XR1 knockout mice, there is a delay in the accumulation of CDC1 in the marginal zone. Uh, there is a, a delay and a decrease in the uh, location in the breeding channel. And in the end, uh, less of them make it into the T cell zone. So it shows that XR1 is critical for optimizing or promoting a better migration of the CDC1 into the T cell zone. And how do NK cells do that? How do they promote CDC1 to go into the T cell zone? So Karin and her group looked at candidate genes. They looked at genes that are expressed in NK cells during MCM infection. So they found that NK cells express the gene encoded GMCSF, XCL1, and interferon gamma. They could show at the protein level that ex vivo isolated NK cells from infected mice are a major source of GMCSF. And so they did see whether GMCSF receptor on CDC1 is critical for the upregulation of CCR7. They generated mixed bone marrow chimera, mixing wild type bone marrow with GMCSF receptor knockout bone marrow. And they looked in those mice at the location, at the maturation of uh, CDC1 by flow cytometry, looking at CCR7 expression. And they found out that in the same spleen of the same infected mouse, the GMCSF receptor knockout CDC1s were not able to upregulate CCR7 as efficiently as the wild type uh, CDC1. So, this strongly supports the hypothesis that NK cells promote CDC1 migration to the T cell zone via inducing CCR7 expression on CDC1 through GMCSF. And she had, there are other data supporting that in the paper. And for uh, finishing this story, now we wanted to make the link with CDC1 migration uh, and uh, T cell activation. So what uh, they did, they look at the frequency of antiviral CDA T cells in wild type mice and XR1 knockout mice. And you can see that at day uh, six after infection, you have less antiviral CD80 cells in XR1 knockout mice than in wild type mice, showing that XR1 compromises uh, the induction of antiviral CD80 cell responses uh, in, uh, in mice. And it was associated with higher viral replication in the liver and the spleen in XR1 knockout mice than wild type mice, which probably results from a partial impairment of both the NK cell response and the CD80 cell response in the absence of XR1 due to uh, a deficient cross tope between CDC1 and NK cells and between CDC1 and CDT cells. And finally, is CCR7 
on uh, CDC1 in the spin of infected mice necessary for antiviral CD80 cell response. To test that, we took advantage of another new mouse model that was generated that expressed diphtheratoxin under the XR1 gene, which makes those mice constitutively and specifically devoid of CDC1. So it's what we call CDC1 less mice. So we, we mix bone marrow from wild type mice and CDC less mice, and from wild type mice and CCR7 knockout mice. So in those mice who have normal CDC1 mixed with uh, CCR7 knockout CDC1, or you have normal CDC1, but in lower numbers. And then we compare them uh, with uh, mixed bone marrow chimera, CDC less one mice, uh, bone marrow mixed with CCR7 knockout bone marrow. So those mice have the peculiarity of lacking CCR7 only on CDC1. So that's a specific deficiency of CCR7 in CDC1. And one you can see, is that there is no there is a strong induction of antiviral responses in the two control chimera, but there is a strong significant decrease of antiviral CD80 cell responses in the mice that are lacking CCR7 expression specifically on CDC1. So it does show that optimal CD80 cell activation against MCMV in this model requires CCR7 expression in CDC1. So we ended up with the following model, which is that during systemic MCM infection. CDC1 are attracted to the sites of viral replication in the, viral, uh, in, the, in the marginal zone of the spleen by innate lymphocytes expressing XCL1, that is attracting CDC1 via the chemokine receptor XCL1. These are only at cells. There is redundancy. Some other cells can, uh, can replace NK cells for XCL1 expression. But then you have local interaction between infected cells, CDC1, and NK cells. These allow CDC1 to pick up antigens for cross-presentation from the infected cells to be ready to present viral antigen to CD80 cells. And the NK cells are licensing CDC1 for immunogenic maturation in part through delivering them GMCSF and also interferon gamma. And GMCSF is critical for upregulation of CCR7 on CDC1 by licensing them to migrate to the T cell zone to go into the proper area for CD80 cell priming. And in the same paper, uh, Karin and our group extended that to a local infection in the ear of the mice. But in this local infection, it's not the NK cells that were the critical source of XCL1 and the critical uh, cell helping uh, CDC1 to do immunogenic maturation. It was uh, uh, dendritic epidermal T cells that were doing this job. Importantly, uh, our study was published uh, in iScience, but there was a study published in parallel in immunity by uh, the group of uh, Veit Buchholz, uh, where they had converging results and complementary results through single cell approaches and, uh, and, and, and single cell fate mapping and functional analysis in mice that identified the new type 1 innate lymphoid lineage that is expressing uh, NK cell markers, including uh, the, the activation receptor Y14 and H. And they showed that these uh, cells bridge innate and adaptive recognition of our infection by licensing CDC1 for uh, CD80 cell activation, which is very similar to what we show. And then I would like to finish with a third part illustrating the last uh, component of our strategy, which is experimental testing in primates. So in our original 2008 paper, we also looked at monocyte-derived disease to compare them to the disease from the blood in humans and the spleen in the mouse. And when we clustered monocyte derived disease with monocytes, macrophages, and spleen and blood disease, we could see that the monocyte derived disease cluster with monocytes and macrophages and not with the blood and, and, and spleen disease, showing that these are very different cell types. And therefore, we needed to go away from for certain aspects of the in vitro monocyte derived disease model to understand the biology of CDC1 and PDC because we needed a better in vitro model for these cell types. So we decided to do that by trying to differentiate in vitro human disease from cord blood progenitors. So we uh, thought that we uh, look at the literature and what was known in the mouse to develop a rationale for how to do that. And it's known in the mouse that the key cytokine driving uh, plasma cytoid disease, CDC1 and CDC2 differentiation is fleet 3 ligand, signaling to STAT3. And part of it is that it drives IRF8 expression, and IRF8 is a transcription factor that is key for the development or the function of mouse uh, CDC1 and mouse plasma cytoid disease. Uh, in contrast, GMCSF that is used to generate monocyte derived disease is signaling through STAT5, and it can partially inhibit the SLE3 through STAT3 signaling, and therefore it can, it can unbalance the differentiation of of hematopoietic progenitors toward monocyte derived disease or inflammatory disease at the expense of CDC1 and plasma cytoid disease. So we decided 
to uh, work with V3 ligand and not to include GMCSF or only at low concentration and late in the, in the culture uh, protocol. And when we did that, we were able to obtain in our cord blood cultures from human uh, cord blood uh, cells that were expressing BDCA3, also called CD1 and 41 and uh, low level of CDNC, but more importantly, that were expressing typical markers conserved in mouse and human CDC1, XCR1, CLEC9A, and KDM1, contrary to monocyte derived disease uh, derived from classical monocytes or to the other disease we found in the culture that were resembling monocyte derived disease. And indeed, we did gene expression analysis of these cell types, and you can see that the cord blood derived CDC1, they cluster with the blood uh, CDC1, whereas the cord blood derived XR1 negative cells, they cluster with the classical monocyte derived disease. So in our culture, we have on the one end uh, class monocyte derived disease derived from cord blood, and on the other hand, CDC1 derived from cord blood. And we could show indeed that the CDC1 derived from cord blood they express the key gene signatures of blood CDC1, including CL1, KDM1, CLEC9A, RF8, TLR3, uh, FE3. Uh, so in conclusion, in this system, we develop simultaneously in our culture, human monocyte derived disease and human CDC1. We show that the, these in vitro derived CDC1 resemble blood, resemble blood CDC1 based on their gene expression profile, which I don't show here based on cytokine and proskydomic response to Taylor stimulation, which is very important because they don't respond to the same adjuvants that monocyte drive disease, which has implications for vaccination and immunotherapy, and that they were more efficient for cross-presentation of antigen from dying cells that monocyte drive disease, uh, which is consistent with what was known about mouse CDC1 and cross-presentation. The main issue in this model is that we could not develop PDC and CDC2s, and we wanted to better understand what are the mechanisms uh, driving CC1 and PDC differentiation in function. So we further implemented this system by adding feeder layer cells because in other papers it had shown that in humans you could develop on the, uh, plasma cytoid dendritic cells from cord blood cells, but most efficiently you should put them on feeder stromal cells, especially OP9 cells. And there were controversy in the field whether or not signaling was important or necessary or not, uh, promoting or inhibitory human PDC differentiation. So we decided to test notch signaling. So we cultivated the cord blood cells with an appropriate cocktail of cytokines on OP9 feeder cells, so OP9 feeder cells expressing a notch ligand or a combination of the two. And we look at differentiation. So in these cord blood cultures, we can nicely identify PDCs as co-expressing CD1 or 23 and BDCA2, and CDC1 as co-expressing BDCA3 and CLEC9A. And you can see that if you work with OP9 feeder cells, you mostly get PDCs, but no CDC1. If you work with notch expressing notch ligand expressing OP9 cells, you decrease the fraction of PDC, but you significantly and in a very strong way increase the differentiation of CDC1. And if you mix the two, you manage to preserve the very good PDC differentiation and have a very good CDC1 differentiation, which is illustrated here. When you take uh, the two feeder together, you have a very good CDC1 differentiation, contrary if you use only OP9, and you restore a better PDC differentiation as compared to if you use OP9 DLN1. And we could pharmacologically show that not signaling is actually key for human CDC1 differentiation in those cultures. Uh, so we could show that we had simultaneous development of human CDC1 and PDC in this culture system with high yields, that fleet 3 was absolutely required for CDC1 generation, and that it synergizes with thrombopoietin and IL-7 for having high yields, and that our in vitro derived PDCs and CDC1 on the base on single transcriptional profiling and cytokine response to Taylor stimulation were behaving like normal blood uh, CDC1 and PDCs. But uh, what we wanted to do next is to genetically manipulate those cells to be able to move from what we saw in the mouse and the, the mechanistic analysis in the mouse to mechanistic analysis in the human, and this is an unpublished work, but that is available as a preprint in BioArchive from a talented postdoc that left my lab la, at the end of last year, Xin Long Luo. So what he did, he optimized the system to be able to transduce the progenitors with antiviral vectors before differentiating them into disease. And then we looked at the consequences of the gene manipulation on the DC differentiation and function. So in these cultures, you can uh, exclude macrophages and monocytes based on CD206 and CD14 expression. You can identify CDC1 based on co-expression of CLEC9A and CD1 and RUN41. PDC is based on the co-expression of BDCA2 and CD1 and RUN23. 
And then within PDCs and TDC1, you can look at the fraction of transduced cells that express the reporter blue fluorescent protein and untransduced cells that are not blue. And then you can uh, calculate whether there is a bias in the frequency of transduced cells in different cell population to see if the fact of transducing cells and genetically manipulating them is uh, altering the differentiation of survival. So here it's an illustration. You can look at total immune cells in the culture and look at the frequency of transduced and untransduced cells. You calculate the ratio of transduced to untransduced. You do the same thing within the CDC1 gate and the same thing within the PDC gate. And then you normalize the ratio of the CDC1 to the ratio of the total immune cells. Same thing for PDC. If the ratio is above one, it means you have a preferential enrichment of transduced cells in CDC1 as compared to the other immune cells. So the genetic manipulation that you made is favoring CDC1 differentiation of survival. And if the ratio is below one, is the reverse. It means you are counter selecting transduced cells. So the gene manipulation you did is preventing CDC1 differentiation or accelerating their death. And so as a proof of principle, we did the knockout of IRF8. You can see here the control SHRNA like Z lantiviral vectors. And here is the result of the culture with the SHRF8. So there is already a counter selection of the whole immune lineage because IRF8 is important for many immune cells. But this decrease is much more pronounced in CDC1. We have hardly any more any CDC1 in the transduced cells in the culture. We only get CDC1 from the untransduced cells in the same culture. And we also have a decrease in PDC. This is quantified here and it's very significant. You don't have any cell intrinsic effect of RFA, RFA loss for macrophages and monocytes, but you have a very strong uh, decrease of the frequency of PDC and CDC1 from the progenitors that are knocked down for IRF8. We could reciprocally show that IRF8 overexpression promotes CDC1 differentiation. So it's loss of function, gain of function showing the same conclusion. And as a negative control, we could show that the knockdown of IRF5 is not uh, changing the cell differentiation. So it's really specific to the knockdown of IRF8. Then we developed a similar system to look at cytokine production in response to TLR stimulation. And here as a proof of concept, we knock down IRS7 to look at PDC, IFN, and alpha beta production, because in the mouse, it has been clearly shown that IRS7 in PDC is key for IFN, alpha, and lambda production by PDC in response to TLA7 and 9. So if you look, we do in stimulate the cells with R8, 8, and then we do intracellular staining of the whole culture for IFN, lambda, or IFN, alpha, or TNF, and we compare the uh, transduced cells in blue from the untransduced cells for the frequency of cytokine producing cells. You can see that with the SHRNA control, there is no difference whether it's for IFN lambda, IFN alpha, or TNF. But in the cells that are transduced and knocked down for IRF7, you lose, uh, the, you decrease the ability to produce IFN alpha and you decrease the ability to produce IFN lambda, but you don't decrease the ability to produce TNF, which is illustrated here with many repeat experiments with different donors and different SHRNA where you can see that there is a specific loss of PDC, uh, IFN alpha and IFN lambda production upon IRS7 knockdown. It's not the case for TNF production and it doesn't affect CDC1 response to poly -IC. So uh, we, at the control, we could show that there was no significant impact on this function of IRF5 or IRF8 knockdown. Uh, Based on this, then we looked at new candidate genes. So we wanted first to expand to the human knowledge that had been gained in the mouse, but not expanding the human. So we showed that ID2, a transcription factor that was shown key to CDC1 differentiation in mouse is also key for CDC1 differentiation in human. That this script is key for CDC1 differentiation in human like it was shown before in the mouse. And that reciprocally BCLA11A transcription factor is key for PC differentiation in human like it was shown before in the mouse. And we, we looked at the RAP7 protein and identified new RAP7 proteins, uh, new functions of RAP7 proteins in DC differentiation in human. And we even looked at viral restriction factors because ultimately we want to look at the role of viral restriction, restriction in the infectivity of disease. But first we needed to look whether they change the differentiation. And surprisingly, we found that certain trans viral restriction factors, including SAMHD1, which is a very well-known restriction factors for HIV and other antiviruses, is actually uh, SAMHD1 knockdown compromises CDC1 differentiation and on the contrary facilitates PDC differentiation, showing that SAMHD1 is involved in promoting CDC1 uh, differentiation in, in humans. Uh, and, and we look at other uh, uh, factors as well. I want to finish by saying that 
we have set up uh, the stage to be able to do more uh, larger screen uh, analysis in humans. And we want to do CRISPR-Cas9 screen with our uh, in vitro model. And uh, I got funding for that. I'm looking for a talented postdoc to carry out this project. The deadline for application is at the end of next month. It's for a contract duration of up to four years. And we are looking for somebody who has a PhD in molecular biology, virology, or immunology, who knows how to do a mammalian cell culture and genetic engineering of mammalian cells, high, uh, knows flow cytometry, can work in the base cell free environment. And so I hope I will receive a, a suitable applications. Uh, so in our general strategy, we managed to advance a lot. That's what is in green in uh, aligning non dc cell types between human and mouse, refining the definition of the identity of DC types, including at the molecular level, generating hypotheses about uh, the, the mechanisms controlling the differentiation and function of DC types, testing that experimentally in mice. We still have some progress to do there. And uh, we are still at early stages of trying to translate that in uh, primates. So of course, I want to finish by thanking all the people involved in the work. Uh, the people in blue are the people that are involved in the work I showed. The people in black are people that are currently in my team, but uh, working on new projects. The collaborations, both in France with inside EML and outside of CML and in, uh, in other countries. And uh, the funding, uh, the funding uh, agencies that uh, give us the money to do the studies. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. That was uh, terrific. Thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation, really impressive body of work. So just to remind everybody how to address questions to Mark, if you have questions about his talk, um, you can find these on uh, Twitter. So Q&A via Twitter as usual. So search for the Global Immunotalks. You can find that tweet. And then Mark's Twitter handle is at DeloCIML. So uh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, we'll see you next week. And Mark, thanks again so much for joining us from, from France today. Thank you very much for the invitation. And bye-bye everybody. You're very welcome. Take care.